Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. So as always, I'm going to start with a blurb, and then I'm going to go through and share some of my tabs. And then we'll share some overall thoughts and a rating at the end. What I do want to say before I get started, this book was actually picked out to me by my friend Sherry. So basically each month I buy myself six new books. And to kind of mix it up a little bit, I just got her to pick six random numbers from, um, you know, on my list. And this is one of the books she picked out. And it's surprisingly apt because it's basically set in New York, well, in America after a super flu. Anyway, the blurb. Winner of the Arthur C. Clarke Award 2015. What was lost in the collapse? Almost everything. Almost everyone. But there is still such beauty. One snowy night in Toronto, famous actor Arthur Leander dies on stage whilst performing the role of a lifetime. That same evening, a deadly virus touches down in North America. The world will never be the same again. Twenty years later, Kirsten, an actress in the Travelling Symphony, performs Shakespeare in the settlements that have grown up since the collapse. But then her newly hopeful world is threatened. If civilization was lost, what would you preserve? And how far would you go to protect it? So yeah, this is kind of oddly relevant. Um, they're talking about this this disease outbreak. They all just boarded the same flight out of Mexico. The 16-year-old? I don't think she'll make it. So there's this initial group of patients, the Moscow passengers. Then this afternoon, a new patient comes in. Same symptoms, but this one wasn't on the flight. This one's just an employee at the airport. I'm not sure what you're... A gate agent, who I said. I'm saying his only contact with the other patients was speaking with one of them about where to board the hotel shuttle. Oh, Jeevan said, that sounds bad. Then they talk about SARS, and um, then we get this. You told me to call you if there was ever a real epidemic. I remember. We've admitted over 200 flu patients since this morning, who I said. 160 in the past three hours. 15 of them have died. The, uh, the ER is full of new cases. We've got beds parked in hallways. Health Canada's about to make an announcement. It's just eerily close to home, you know? So again, just hitting quite close, close to home at the moment. It's the fastest incubation period I've ever seen. I just saw a patient. She works as an orderly here at the hospital, on duty when the first patient started coming in this morning. She started feeling sick a few hours into her shift, went home early, her boyfriend drove her back in two hours ago, and now she's on a ventilator. You get exposed to this, you're sick within hours. And then we start to get some panic buying here. Jeevan's understanding of disaster preparedness was based entirely on action movies, but on the other hand, he'd seen a lot of action movies. He started with water, filled one of the oversized shopping carts with as many cases and bottles as he could fit. There was a moment of doubt on the weight of the cash registers, straining against the weight of the cart. Was he overreacting? But he was committed, he decided. Too late to turn back. And so he has his phone call and we get, Are you sick? Jeevan was pushing the cart towards the door. Good night, Jeevan. Who had disconnected and Jeevan was alone in the snow. He felt possessed. The next cart was all toilet paper. Yep. Sounds about right. And then... I just thought this chapter here was pretty good. Um, this is just before we get into uh, what part two of Midsummer Night's Dream. An incomplete list. No more diving into pools of chlorinated water lit green from below. No more ball games played out under floodlights. No more porch lights with moths fluttering on summer nights. No more trains running under the surface of cities on the dazzling power of the electric third rail. No more cities. No more films, except rarely, except with a generator drowning out half the dialogue, and only then for the first little while until the fuel for the generators ran out, because automobile gas goes stale after two or three years. Aviation gas lasts longer, but it was difficult to come by. No more screens shining in the half-light as people raise their phones above the crowd to take photographs of concert stages. No more concert stages lit by candy-coloured halogens. No more electronica, punk, electric guitars. No more pharmaceuticals. No more certainty of surviving a scratch on one's hand, a cut on a finger while chopping vegetables for dinner, a dog bite. No more flight. No more towns glimpsed from the sky through airplane windows, points of glimmering light. No more looking down from 30,000 feet and imagining the lives lit up by those lights at that moment. No more airplanes. No more requests to put your tray table in its upright and locked position. But no, this wasn't true. There were still airplanes here and there. They stood dormant on runways and in hangars. They collected snow on their wings. In the cold months, they were ideal for food storage. In summer, the ones near orchards were filled with trays of fruit that dehydrated in the heat. Teenagers snuck into them to have sex. Rust blossomed and streaked. No more countries, all borders unmanned. No more fire departments, no more police. No more road maintenance or garbage pickup. No more spacecraft rising up from Cape Canaveral, from the Baconur Cosmodrome, from Vandenberg, Placetsk, Tanagashima, burning paths through the atmosphere into space. No more internet. 
No more social media, no more scrolling through litanies of dreams and nervous hopes and photographs of lunches, cries for help and expressions of contentment and relationship status updates with heart icons whole or broken, plans to meet up later, pleas, complaints, desires, pictures of babies dressed as bears or peppos for Halloween. No more reading and commenting on the lives of others, and in so doing, feeling slightly less alone in the room. No more avatars. And so then we get to this travelling band of sort of actors and musicians in the apocalypse. And uh, they say, yeah, someone had written Sartre, hell is other people, in pen inside one of the caravans. And someone else had scratched out other people and substituted flutes. So uh, the, one of the characters says, no, really, I'm curious. What's your understanding of work? And they reply, work is combat. I like this exchange too. Um, you remembered. Of course, Clark said. That's one thing I like about birthdays. They stay in one place. Same spot on the calendar, year in, year out. But the years keep going faster, have you noticed? Thought this was interesting about the state of society after the collapse. The places we return to more than once aren't dissimilar to here. Some places you pass through once and never return because you can tell something's very wrong. Everyone's afraid, or it seems like some people have enough to eat and other people are starving. Or you see pregnant 11 year olds and you know the place is either lawless or in the grip of something, a cult of some kind. There are towns that are perfectly reasonable, logical systems of governance and such, and then you pass through two years later and they've slid into disarray. All towns have their own traditions. There are towns like this one, where you're interested in the past. You've got a library. We get uh, this a little bit here as well. Dieter harboured strong anti-tattoo sentiments. He said he'd seen a man die of an infected tattoo once. Kirsten also had two black knives tattooed on the back of her right wrist, but these were less troubling to Dieter, being much smaller and ink to mark specific events. We get this little quote which ends a chapter. Hell is the absence of the people you long for. Yep. Then we get here. The beauty of this world where almost everyone was gone. If hell is other people, what is a world with almost no people in it? And I know some people... I've been noticing this with my friends more, actually. Um, something I've been thinking about, which will sound harsh and I'm sorry. You said you'd always be my friend, but you're not, actually, are you? I've only realised that recently. You don't have any interest in my life. This is going to seem bitter, but I don't mean it that way, V. I'm just stating a fact here. You'll only ever call me if I call you first. Have you noticed that? If I call and leave a message, you'll call me back, but you will never call me first. And I think that's kind of a horrible thing, V, when you're supposed to be someone's friend. I always come to you. You always say you're my friend, but you'll never come to me, and I think I have to stop listening to your words, V, and take stock instead in your actions. My friend C thinks my expectations of friendship are too high, but I don't think he's right. And one of the characters here says, Everyone knows when you've got a terrible marriage. It's like having bad breath. You get close enough to a person and it's obvious. And uh, someone's surprised that this celebrity washes dishes. And they say, Yeah, the housekeeper was talking to the press. So I fired her and then the dishwasher broke. And someone's singing, It's the end of the world as we know it by R.E.M. Which interestingly, I saw a list on Spotify. They said this is one of the songs that's recently had a resurgence in popularity because of coronavirus. We have a character who's going through withdrawal because she's missing her antidepressants. One of the unexpected benefits here, it goes, uh, Clark had never thought much about airport design, but he was grateful that so much of this particular airport was glass. They lived in daylight and went to bed at sundown because they're all trapped in this airport, you see. And it's true, they're lucky there that they were in an airport so that they can actually see things. thought this was kind of terrifying as well. I don't think this is a quarantine, Clark said. I think there's actually really nothing out there, or at least nothing good. There were, in fact, a number of solid arguments against the quarantine theory, namely that the pandemic had started in Europe, the last news reports had indicated chaos and disarray on every continent except Antarctica, and anyway, how would one even go about isolating North America in the first place, given air travel and the fact that South America was, after all, more or less attached? Okay, we've got two bits on this page I want to highlight. So uh, I want to read these two paragraphs here about life in the airport. They traded languages. By day 80, most of the people who'd arrived without English were learning it in informal groups, and the English were studying one or more of the languages carried here by Lufthansa, Singapore Airlines, Cathay Pacific and Air France. Clark was learning French from Annette, who'd been a Lufthansa flight attendant. He whispered phrases to himself as he went about the chores of daily existence, the hauling of water and washing of clothes in the sink, learning to skin a deer, building bonfires, cleaning. Je m'appelle Clark, j'habite dans l'aéroport, tu me manques, tu me manques, tu me manques which means, I miss you, I miss you, I miss you. Well, technically it means, you are missed, you are missed. Well, you are missed by me, because Tuma is reflexive, so Tuma, you, me, missed. A rape on the day, a rape on the night of day 85, the airport woken after midnight by a woman's scream. They tied the man up until sunrise and then drove him into the forest at gunpoint, told him if he returned he'd be shot. I'll die out here alone, he said, sobbing, and no one disagreed, but what else could they do? I, this this amused me here as well, this uh, resupply. 
The scouting party returned the next day, exhausted and cold, with with three steel carts from an industrial kitchen piled high with supplies. They'd found a chilies that no one had looted yet, they said, and they'd spent the night shivering in booths. They had toilet paper, Tabasco sauce, napkins, salt and pepper, enormous tins of tomatoes, dinnerware and bags of rice, gallons of pink hand soap, enormous tins of tomatoes. I've got to show you this. Check it out, enormous tins of tomatoes. They got some of these. These are heavy. This is 2.5 kilograms. Sold it in the corner shop, so I was like, might as well stock up. And then I wanted to read this bit out as well here. Um, a day later, the first stranger walked in. They'd taken to posting guards with whistles so that they might be warned of a stranger's approach. They'd all seen the post-apocalyptic movies with the dangerous stragglers fighting it out for the last few scraps. Although actually, when she thought about it, Annette said, the post-apocalyptic movies she'd seen had all involved zombies. I'm just saying, she said, it could be much worse. But the first man who walked in under low grey skies seemed less dangerous than stunned. He was dirty, of indeterminate age, dressed in layers of clothes, and he hadn't shaved in a long time. He appeared on the road with a gun in his hand, but he stopped and let the gun fall to the pavement when Tyrone shouted for him to drop it. He raised his hands over his head and stared at the people gathering around him. Everyone had questions. He seemed to struggle for speech. His lips moved silently and he had to clear his throat several times before he could speak. Clark realised that he hadn't spoken in some time. I was in the hotel, he said, finally. I've followed your footprints in the snow. There were tears on his face. Okay, someone said, but why are you crying? I thought I was the only one, he said. thought this was interesting here too. Um, there was a school here now, in Concourse C. Like educated children everywhere, the children in the airport school memorised abstractions. The airplanes outside once flew through the air. You could use an airplane to travel to the other side of the world. But the school teacher was a man who'd had frequent fall. But the school teacher was a man who'd had frequent flyer status on two airlines. When you were on an airplane, you had to turn off your electronic devices before takeoff and landing. Devices such as the tiny flat machines that played music, and the larger machines that opened up like books and had screens that hadn't always been dark, the insides brimming with circuitry. And these machines were the portals into a worldwide network. Satellites beamed information down to Earth. Goods travelled in ships and airplanes across the world. There was no place on Earth that was too far away to get to. They were told about the internet, how it was everywhere and connected everything, how it was us. They were shown maps and globes, the lines of the borders that the internet had transcended. This is the yellow mass of land in the shape of a mitten. This pin here on the wall is Seven City. That was Chicago. That was Detroit. The children understood dots on maps, here, but even the teenagers were confused by the lines. There had been countries and borders. It was hard to explain. We have a character who said he uh, used to be a copywriter. So this was interesting here. It says, uh, she'd been thinking lately about writing her own play, seeing if she could convince Gil to stage a performance with the symphony actors. She wanted to write something modern, something that addressed this age in which they somehow landed. Survival might be insufficient, she'd told Deirter in late night arguments, but on the other hand, so was Shakespeare. He trotted out his usual arguments about how Shakespeare had lived in a plague-ridden society with no electricity and so did the travelling symphony. But look, she'd told him, the difference was that they'd seen electricity, they'd seen everything, they'd watched a civilization collapse and Shakespeare hadn't. In Shakespeare's time, the wonders of technology were still ahead, not behind them, and far less had been lost. We get this little, this little exchange. I see, Saeed said. You enjoy this line of work, or, you, or are you in it for the pension? What's a pension? The one with the machete asked. He was very young. He looked about 15. And so I want to read um, this little section out here. It's quite a long little one, so brace yourselves. Uh, and this is about knife, knife tattoos. Some of the characters have knife tattoos on their wrists. The knife tattoos on Kirsten's wrist. The first marked a man who came at her in her first year with the symphony, when she was 15, rising fast and lethal out of the underbrush, and he never spoke a word, but she understood his intent. As he neared her, sound drained from the world, and time seemed to slow. She was distantly aware that he was moving quickly, but there was more than enough time to pull a knife from her belt and send it spinning, so slowly, steel flashing in the sun, until it merged with the man and he clutched at his throat. He shrieked. She couldn't hear him, but she watched his mouth open and she knew others must have heard, because the symphony was suddenly all around her, and this was when the volume slowly rose and time resumed its normal pace. It's a physiological response to danger, Deirta told her, when Kirsten mentioned the soundlessness of those seconds, the way time stretched and expanded. This seemed a reasonable enough explanation, but there was nothing in her memories to account for how calm she was afterward when she pulled a knife from the man's throat and cleaned it, and this was why she stopped trying to remember her lost year on the road, the 13 unremembered months between leaving Toronto with her brother and arriving in the town in Ohio, where they stayed until he died and she left with the symphony. Whatever that year on the road contained, she realised, it, it was nothing she wanted to know about. The second knife was for a man who fell two years later, outside Mackinac City. 
The symphony had been warned of brigands in the area, but it was a shock when they materialised out of fog on the road ahead. Four men, two with guns and two with machetes. One of the gunmen asked for food, four horses, and a woman in a flat monotone voice. Give us what we want, he said, and no one has to get hurt. And no one has to die. But Kirsten sensed rather than heard the sixth guitar fitting an arrow to his bow behind her back. Guns first, he murmured, close to her ear. I've got the one on the left. One, two. And on three, the men with guns were falling, one staring past the arrow protruding from his forehead and the other clutching at Kirsten's knife in his chest. The conductor finished the others with two quick shots. They retrieved the weapons, dragged the men into the forest to be food for the animals, and wandered out and, went, and continued on into Mackinaw City to perform Romeo and Juliet. She hoped there would never be a third. Uh, so here we have what Arthur does on his last morning on Earth, but this also sounds like me with a hangover. On his last morning on Earth, Arthur was tired. He'd laid awake until sunrise and then drifted out of a twilight half-sleep in the late morning, sluggish and dehydrated, a throbbing headache behind his eyes. Orange juice would have helped, but when he looked in the fridge there was only a mouthful left in the bottom of the carton. Why hadn't he bought more? He had had insomnia for the past three nights, and his exhaustion was such that this was enough to send him spiralling into something not far from fury. The fury contained with difficulty by breathing deeply and counting to five, soothed by the cold air on his face. And then in, in the acknowledgements we have a nod to The Passage by Justin Cronin, which I buddy read with Mara from books like Whoa, really didn't enjoy. Uh, and then at the end there are some questions for discussion as well, which can be quite pretentious depending upon the novel, but I guess I understand why they went for it here. But yeah, all in all, I did enjoy this book. I thought it was beautifully written. I thought it was very well imagined and again, very timely to read it now. Um, you know, Emily St. John Mandel predicted, or not predicted, but she envisioned the natural way in which human beings would respond to a lot of things. And it was kind of fascinating to see that come to life in here. Uh, and to see the parallels of what's going in the, on in the world now, you know. Overall, I would give it a 4.5 out of 5 and would definitely recommend it, but not if you're looking for some escapist reading at the moment. So there we have it. That's what I made of Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.